It's time for the Chip Race. For strategy this week, we are joined by an up-and-coming British pro and Twitch streamer. He is recently back from a successful, albeit cross barry trip to Dust Till Dawn for the WPT. He is our good friend, Jamie Nixon. Jamie, welcome. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated. Delighted to have you on the show, Jamie. Before we get to the hand, I want to ask you about your Twitch stream. From my brief stint as a part-time Twitcher, I'll be very honest, it sort of broke me. I remember nights when my screen had withered down to the last 25 quid bowl comp and I found it impossible to maintain the high energy persona. I remember a couple of times Dara, who was tuning in, would ring me after just to make sure I was okay. I guess he (laughs) he must have thought I was utterly depressed uh, with my lot. How do you keep it going on those types of nights? I think Twitch streamers are all dead on the inside and alive on the outside. I think that's how it works, really. (laughs) It's one of those things where you have a job to do in terms of entertaining the audience. And although on the inside you may kind of think, oh, shit, how have I only got an 11 euro comp left? And it's going to go on forever. There's still 170 runners. Nobody's going to want to watch this. People are still there and watching it. So you have kind of like a duty to them. And if you put on a decent show for them during those times, then they're going to stick around for when you have the good times as well. So I think that's what's in the back of my mind when I have one small run left. And it's just a case of trying to entertain yourself as well as the audience. So maybe yeah. like chucking out little competitions or something like that, or just having a bit of banter with the chat. It keeps you going, really. Because if I wasn't on a stream and I was just one table and a ball comp by myself, I might be quite incentivized to punt it off and then go play on the Xbox or something instead. So it's nice to have people there keeping you in check. Yeah, I'd like to take issue with something David said. I do remember his brief Twitch career. He said there it was hard to maintain a high energy persona. I never really remember a high energy persona from David. He just kind of started as <laughs> low energy. And then by the end, it was just him sitting there with a large glass of gin, <laughs> kicking buttons very somberly. <laughs> this is the shove. This is the snap. Watch it. Watch it. Yeah, he can't resist. Ten jack suited. Fuck, man. He's flopped the fucking world. Come on. <laughs> Look how upset he is! <laughs> I, mean, I haven't even got a sound on, and he's flipping the fuck out. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm just drinking my, um, as I named it, the uh, Fuck You Simpsons. Um, it's a uh, a wicked mixture of uh, tequila, rum, peach juice, frozen pineapple, frozen strawberries, um, grenadine, lime cordial. And, uh, and my own tears. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jamie, to the hand, it comes from the WPT in Nottingham. You had run up a huge stack and were sitting on 159k at Big Blind 400. From the cutoff, playing about 120k, Orpen Kisakigoglu, I hope I pronounced that right, open to 1k. It falls to you in the Big Blind and you look down at Ace Queen, the Ace of Diamonds Queen of Clubs. You make it 3.9k and Orpen calls. Nothing particularly weird so far, so I'm keen to get straight to the flop, if you don't mind. The flop comes six of diamonds, two of diamonds, two of spades. You see bet 3,200 and he calls. Dara, on a board like this where you have 100% C bet, could you make an argument for an even smaller sizing? You could certainly make an argument, but I like Jamie's sizing. He's out of position. We're incentivized to go for slightly bigger sizing because of that. We also have a fairly significant range advantage on this board. This is a board that really doesn't hit either player. Neither of them should have too many 2x or 6x in their range. So whoever was ahead pre-flop should still be ahead. And that should normally be Jamie since he's the three better. Well, Jamie, turning to you then, how much are the stack depths relevant in this pot? I'm going to have to go quite large on a lot of turns. So I'd rather go a smallish size in now, but I am out of position, so I don't want to go too small. There's a lot of good turns for me. Ace, Queen, Diamond, all turns that I can barrel on. Going 3.2k allows me to go a little bit bigger on turns to kind of fold out a lot of the weakest part of his range. That makes sense. Well, to the turn, it comes the King of Diamonds, so one of the cards you were sort of hoping to get. The board now reads Six of Diamonds, Two of Diamonds, Two of Spades, King of Diamonds. Jamie, you bet 12k and Orpen calls. This is a mm-hmm. great card for your range and you now have the nut flush draw. Those two things in combination make this a must bet. When you choose the 12k sizing into a pot of 15k, what hands exactly are you targeting to fold? I mean, we're trying to fold out a lot of his equity. We're trying to fold out a lot of his maybe sevens, eights, 
nines type hands as well that don't have a diamond it might even fall tens in this spot because the stack sizes and things like that as well and then maybe hands that he's floated me with on flops say if he's got jack 10 that has a back door flush draw on the flop anything like that i feel like we can just get them to fold take the pot down we still only have ace high at this point so we're just targeting all kind of like the weaker part of his range really and then if we do get calls we do have the redraw to the no flush Indeed we do. Well, Dara, in this spot, are you already thinking ahead to the next street as a must bet, whether you hit your draw or not, or have you a more nuanced approach? I think I have a more nuanced approach, but just to push back slightly on something you said, I don't think this is necessarily a must bet. I think you can actually make a case for three pretty good options on the turn, checking betting the size that Jamie did and even betting smaller. The types of hands we're folding out, as Jamie said, like we will sometimes get to fold out pairs maybe, but I don't think pairs with a diamond are going to fold out. That'll be almost half of his pairs. So while we do get some better hands to fold, a lot of his folds are just hands that are worse than ours, like worse ASX, maybe with a low diamond that he doesn't feel great about either. And because of that, you could make a case for betting smaller to keep those hands around or even for checking because our hand does have showdown. And when I put this to the solver, the solver does actually take the three options. So it considers them equal in EV. It actually checks 60%, bets the size that Jamie bet 30% of the time and bets the smaller size 10%. So I think that makes the case that the turn is actually a very close spot. In a tournament, we might have an incentive actually to try and exert pot control. Generally in a tournament, if there are a number of options that are equal in EV, the one that puts the least amount of chips into the pot is probably better, particularly if we feel we have an edge over the field. The logic there, Dara, is that if we go for a check call line, then we are essentially sitting there with the nut no pair. We can improve and our opponent may just desire to fire once with his floats and then give up. Or indeed, we could obviously hit and then allow him to hang himself. Yeah, that's very true. And I think the other thing you have to bear in mind is that like we have a lot of other hands that have to check this flop. So we want to have some strong hands to check as well. We want to have enough hands that can check call so that we're not just check folding when we're checking. We also want to have a hand that can improve to something really strong on the river. So the nut flush draw in particular is a good hand to have in a checking range because it means that when we check and if he checks behind and the flush gets there on the river, we're not capped. So I think there are a lot of reasons why checking might actually be the best play here. And returning to my original question, are you thinking that you're going to bet this river a lot? Now, given the fact that we've gone for this line as played with Jamie, we've bet, do we need to continue that story? Yeah. Absolutely. You often see these spots in tournaments where you basically have two different plans. When you have a hand like this that has decent showdown, but also has a good chance to improve, you can either just take your showdown and play it relatively passively and sort of exert pot control, or you can take the more aggressive line and try to fold out better hands, essentially turning a pretty strong hand into a semi-bluff. It has to be one or the other. What you don't want to do is you don't want to mix and match the two plans. You don't want to bet the turn and then just give up on the river. And similarly, if you check the turn, you're probably going to play the river relatively passively too unless you hit. That's fantastic advice. I really agree with that. Don't mix your plans. To the river, it comes the nine of diamonds completing the four flush. The pot is 39k roughly. And the final board reads six of diamonds, two of diamonds, two of spades, king of diamonds, nine of diamonds. Orban has about 100k behind and Jamie chooses to bet in this spot 37k. So roughly the pot. Dara, Jamie is looking for a call on this river. Better hands than his will certainly raise. Jamie sizing sort of polarise them to very strong hands and to bluffs. Do you think the choice to polarise in this spot is good? This is probably the one street that I don't really like from Jamie. We're better off going for a smaller sizing. I'm not really sure what the bigger sizing achieves. I think we're trying to get cry calls from a lot of fairly weak hands, like if he has a bad flush. So I think betting small will get called by that range of hands. Betting big may not. So it feels to me like the smaller sizing is better. But we obviously do have to bet because you know we have the no flush now and we don't want to check behind. So I personally would go for the smaller size here. The advantage, I guess, of Jamie's sizing is that because Jamie's gone so big, if the guy shoves, you have to assume he's not bluffing. So we can fold. So if we're beaten, we might get away. Whereas if we choose a smaller sizing and he shoves, he would have a wider shoving range. And we possibly have to call it as a result. So I think there are some merits for betting big, mainly just to make it clear what to do against a raise, but I still prefer the smaller size. When you say smaller sizing, Dara, what size do you like? Not super small, but like 60-65% of pot. Gotcha. Well, Jamie, when you sent us this hand, you said that you decided to go big so you could fold and you felt that the smaller bet opened the door for a bluff so you would be compelled to call the raise in that instance. Why were you thinking like that? Uh, 
because I was an absolute moron at the time, that's why. <laughs> Just to let everyone know, this hand is probably the worst hand I have ever played since I've been full-time playing, uh, <laughs> which is why I sent it to you guys. But yeah, I mean, my initial kind of thoughts were to go fairly big so I could fall to a jam. Now, obviously, I lost my mind within the coming minutes. <laughs> but yeah, I went fairly big with that kind of mindset. Now, I completely agree with what Dara said. I should be going a bit smaller to give the guy a, a wider shoving range, especially considering it was Open, who's obviously a sicko, you know. If anybody's going to find bluffs in these spots, it's him. But yeah, it's one of those things where I can't really justify it. I'm pained talking about it because I'm so annoyed with myself. It's one of the few times I've tilted. Well, Orban does shove for about 100k total and you are faced with exactly that miserable spot where you have to call now 63k to win a pot of 240k. Chip for chip, yeah. you need to be roughly 26-ish percent to break even. So factoring in it being a tournament, especially one that you have an edge in, you probably need yeah. to be good over 30% to make this call. You yeah. did make the call. Jamie, given your prior decision to go big on the river so you could fold, what happened in the seconds in between? I completely lost my mind, David. That's what happened. But, <laughs> it got to the point where he tanked for a very long time and then shoved. And for some reason, I mean, I hate to say we've all done it, but I'm sure we have at some point. I just kind of talked myself into it. I was like, oh, well, if anyone can pull a bluff in this spot, it's open. He's going to know I'm going big to jam on me. <laughs> he can have kings. He can have sixes easily. He can have twos sometimes. He can't have nines because he probably doesn't call the turn with nines without the nine of diamonds. So he can kind of get rid of nines. And then it just, for some reason, came into my head that he can have ace, king, no diamond and turn that into a bluff because he'll know the reason for my sizing. So he'll probably feel like he can get me off the ace of diamonds and he blocks kings if he has ace, king, no diamond. So for some reason that came into my head and I was like, right, I'm on to him here. <laughs> but it was just a complete loss of sanity. I made the call. He flips over kings and I'd, for that final hour of the day, I was just beating myself up, you know. But it's, it's one of those spots where I think the moral of the story is, I mean, despite the fact I should have gone smaller, as Dara correctly said, uh, the moral of the story is if you've got a plan, stick to it. <laughs> Rather than come up with a plan and then do the complete opposite. Well, poor old Jamie there has obviously leveled himself. Dara, in his message to us, he said that this was, quote, the worst decision I made playing this game. He said that <laughs> Orpen doesn't really have any bluffs in this spot. Do you think that's true? I mean, I don't know Orpen, so I can't say for sure. I mean, the one thing I do know is that if we're playing against a balanced opponent, we can't always fold here. We have to call sometimes and fold sometimes to avoid being exploited in either direction because we are quite high up our range and we only have to be good 26% of the time. So if he has the right number of bluffs, this is basically a break-even call and we just have to flip a coin and sometimes call, sometimes fold. But the thing is, people are never completely balanced in these spots. And we've had a few of these on the chip race recently where we get to the river and we say, well, if the guy's balanced, we should maybe call. But the reality is people either over bluff or under bluff. Most people under bluff in these spots. So against a GTO opponent, it's sometimes call, sometimes fold. Against somebody who's over bluffing, it's obviously always call. And against somebody who's under bluffing, it's always fold. Andrew Brokers, who I've stayed with in Vegas uh, the last couple of years at the WSOP, he's always very good in these spots. And he makes two points consistently. First of all, when people are going to bluff you, they generally take the more straightforward way to bluff. So if Orpin was going to bluff, you would expect him to have raised on an earlier street rather than think, OK, I'll call twice and then I'll shove the river when he bets big. So mm. that's the first thing which I think makes it less likely that he's bluffing in practice, whatever about the theory. The second thing is that it's very, very difficult to sort of change your mind about your hand. And that's a human flaw. Like Jamie bets the river big thinking he has the best hand. And, you know, he's very happy with his hand. Then he gets shoved on. Now, against the shove, he's not in great shape. And he kind of instinctively knows that. But it's still very hard to get away from the thought in your head. Well, I have a very strong hand here. It's almost like a grieving process where you have to kind of accept <laughs> that your strong hand is not that strong yeah. anymore before you can fold it. So I think that could be part of the reason why Jamie ended up making the call as well. But in a vacuum against somebody who bluffs the right amount or maybe even bluffs too much, then this wouldn't be a bad call necessarily. Well, Jamie, it can be really painful to rehash hands that didn't go so well. So credit to you for bringing us this one. We wish you very well on the Twitch streets. Jamie Nixon, thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care. Cheers. Thanks, Jamie.